rid of these. That'd probably be a good idea. And already I made a mistake. Because zero is two. Or position one. Alright, so. It'd be a good idea to put a comment in here saying. From equals what? Equals rates sub convert dot to n Take a look at these statements. All right. I'm a rates array. <coughs> Arrays have different elements, and they, and they start with the number zero. That's not a coincidence then when I created my drop-down, my values went 0, 1, and 2. Because those values correspond to the element of the array. So this is the rate for the first currency in the drop-down, which was dollars. This is the rate for the second currency in the drop-down, which was euros. Finally, this is the rate for the third. The way you refer to an element in the array is by giving the array name and a subscript. So rate sub 0 would correspond to the US rate. Rate sub 1 would cor correspond to euro. Rate sub 2 would correspond to pound. Now, arg from is going to contain the value of the index into this array. Right? If we look back at that drop down, Dollars has a value of zero, euros has a value of one, pounds has a value of two. So we're good to go, right? We can simply use that as the index into the array, except for one little thing, is because it comes from a dropdown, that value attribute could be a string. We know it's not in this case, right? Because we made it zero, one, and two, all right? But it could be. So therefore, I have to convert what I got in the drop-down to a double, or to an integer, all right, and then use that as a subscript into the array. So if I've selected US, and I go from dollars to euros, the first drop-down, arg from, is going to have a value of zero. The second drop-down, arg two, is going to have a value of one, all right. I then pass 0 and 1 in here, I convert this from a string 0 to a numeric 0 and get the rate here. I convert this from an, uh, a string 1 to a numeric 1, get the rate here, do the math and return it. Now let's go and make sure this works. <coughs> dollars to pounds. All right, 693. We did that one enough to know that that's the right answer. Dollars to dollars. All right. And again, we go through our whole regression testing. Now this function, we can't test it the way we did before because this function is broke now. We'd have to go and substitute that. So I'll put a comment in here. <coughs> This is broke. Now, let's imagine we want to add a new currency. In fact, I'm 
actually going to enter in a currency, right? Just to demonstrate how easy it is. Let's go and add rubles. So to convert from U.S. dollar to Russian ruble, it is one dollar equals thirty-one point six nine Russian rubles. Okay. So I want to add that. What do I have to do to add that? Add it to the array. Add it to the array. <coughs> what else do I have to do? Add to the drop downs. Pardon me? Then you can go play golf for the rest of the afternoon, right? We can try to beat that Tetris high score. One dollar equals how many rubles? Thirty-one point six nine. Right. So we went from having to we went from having to change add an if statement and add and change however many if statements were previously there. So three, four, five, six, two. Adding two things to the drop down, which we would have had to do anyhow. Putting the rate in, which we would have to do anyhow. And that's it. What's the only, what's the only real thing that could go wrong with this? Well, if the rate changes? Well, if the rate changes, yeah. Again, you would go in. You could go that. If you forget to add a rate, or if your if you're drop down and your a rate array got out of sync. In other words, if I add rubles having a value of three, but I put it in position two of the array. Now, there's ways that we can mitigate that, but for what we're doing here today, that's enough. You know, we could actually, if we're going to do this conversion, we could have a data, and, and we might revisit this actually when we, um, that would actually be a good thing to, to do. We could revisit this when we do databases. We could pull the list of currencies we want to convert from a database, pull their rates from a database, then there would be, it'd be pretty much foolproof as long as the right values were in the database, which, you know, all bets are off if that isn't the case. All right? It's important, I think, to see that, number one, we got there in little jumps. In other words, we started off with a chunk of code that worked. We looked at it and we saw what the vulnerabilities were by going through the mental process of what we would need to change if something changed. All right? So we did that. All right? Um, we addressed each of those step by step and continue to refine it to where at a point where we can, I'm satisfied with this. I'm satisfied with this now. I can live with the fact that I better make sure that those drop downs are in sync with my array list. If that's the only thing I have to do, I'm in pretty good shape. All right, that wasn't too painful to go and add this. And it doesn't get any harder the more that we add. So this code stays about the same if we add 100 different rates. In other words, it's scalable. It doesn't become a monstrosity if we have more than a few rates. Now, there's still a problem with this, though. Still a, a fairly big problem. Is if you could imagine if we're an international business and we are doing currency conversion, uh, you know, a number of different places, we may offer a currency calculator just to give people an idea. We might have prices displayed a couple different ways, you know, or ask people if they want to convert it to there. We might want to do this currency conversion in a bunch of different places. Calculating shipping costs, calculating the price of an item, calculating sales tax and discount or whatever, all right? 
Right now, this calculation is tied to this page. If we wanted to start a second page to do this calculation in some other context, we'd have to go back to the drawing board. Well, that can't stand, right? We, we, have to, we have to do something about that. And that's where putting it in a custom class is. We're going to break out this code and put it in a class by itself, and then we'll be able to use that class from page to page to page. All right? And that's exactly what we'll do next time. We'll take and we'll extract this code uh, from where it lives now on this page and uh, create a class and, and go from there. All right. Questions? Um, I, I was just a little, a little hazy on where the, 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 the 32 came from in, in terms of the integer. Uh, there's, different, there's different sizes of integers depending on how big of a number that you have. All right. Um, there is 1632 and 64. That relates to how many bits there are in this. A 16-bit integer can hold a number up to 6 million, I'm thinking. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, but it can hold a pretty big number. All right? Uh, a 64, 32-bit uh, can hold an even bigger number. And maybe 65,000, is it? Or I don't know, something like that, yeah. The point is, is that that's the number of bits in it. 16-bit can hold a lot of numbers, but not as many as a 32-bit and not as many as a 64-bit. So if I knew I was dealing like with really massive numbers, I'd use a 64-bit integer. Um, a 16-bit integer, again, that would be what? That would be 256 squared, so that would be 6,000. 6, and, and change, 65,000, uh, 65, blah, blah, blah. I doubt if there's 65,000 currencies worldwide, so in 32 would be sufficient. So it just relates to the size of the integer that I'm going to need. Other questions?
one would be more on the coding end as opposed to the design end. <laughs> Mike, have you ever heard of the expression derelict from a movie? Have I ever heard the expression what? Derelict. No, I did not. I have not. All right. Uh, give me something to do this weekend. All right. Uh, I will go unlock the lab. I'll come back and, and post this to Angel and grab the videos, and I'll be in lab. I went nuts. I mean, I had it, the job is 15. 